Greetings, welcome to the Transforming Assessment ser uh, webinar series. Uh, today's session is called Designing for Our Times, Adapting Assessment in an AI Context. And we have a panel of speakers today, uh, and that includes uh, Thomas Cochran from University of Melbourne, that's the Centre of Study of Higher Education, uh, Ruth Duns from Auckland, University of Auckland in the Business School, uh, Mitri Jaziri uh, from La Trobe University. She's from uh, lecturer in Maths and Stats. And Richard Hall, also, so also from La Trobe University, a senior lecturer in computer science. Um, so as you can see on the slide, we're, we're a joint session today with Teleadvisors, SIG. This is the Ascolite Australasian Society for Computers in Social Media Learning, something like that. I don't know if I remember the full acronym. Um, but you're welcome to go and check out the SIGs. Um, we are joined today with people from the Teleadvisor SIG and our learning design SIG. Uh, joining the SIGs is free. So find a SIG that interests you. You can have more than one if you like and sign up. Um, most SIGs run regular web events such as webinars. And this is our joint session uh, across three different SIGs. So it's going to be a little bit of a different format than our normal transforming assessment. So they will have our four speakers, they will uh, go through in sequence uh, and we'll be leaving the discussion to the latter part of the session. But we're going to have an interactive uh, crowdsourcing activity uh, to get the audience members and everybody to contribute their ideas into a mirror board application. We'll provide the links to that a bit later in the session. So uh, just before we get underway, Leanne, are you ready to introduce the first speaker? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks, Matthew. Um, my, my, so my name's Leanne Ngo. I'm an associate professor at La Trobe University. I co-lead the Ascolite Learning Design SIG with my colleagues Kashmira Davies and Keith Hegard as well. So a warm welcome to all. We have four esteemed um, panel speakers with us here today. Um, really looking at how um, they're sharing their practices and insights into the use of adapting their assessments for the AI context. We have four speakers um, speaking for around um, six minutes as well and then we want to leave enough time for Q&A at the end as well which Penny will look after. So just want to introduce the first speaker. We have Thomas Cochran, Associate Professor of Technology Enhanced learning in higher education um, within Melbourne University, within Australia. So over to you, Thomas. Kia ora koutou. So while I'm working at the University of Melbourne, I'm currently in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, back here for Easter. So enjoying some time from the family. So yes, at uh, University of Melbourne, um, of course, ChatGPT was the, the uh, I guess, the big talk of the day uh, earlier in the year and has continued to really be a highlight in uh, all the discussions around technology enhanced learning. Uh, we wanted to have a bit of a response to it. So part of that response was that uh, we put together a web page of resources for academics and uh, we put together pretty quickly uh, just a little two page overview and uh, we call that chat GPT and academic integrity, really focusing on options for what people can do in response to uh, the advent of chat GPT or generative AI uh, for semester one. Basically because you know your assessments are already nailed down for semester one so people couldn't really change the the types of assessments they were doing without going through academic board etc so giving them some tips and ideas for you know sort of slightly modifying their current assessment uh, strategies to uh, make them less vulnerable to cheating and plagiarism from chat gpt uh, the university also put out an official statement which is really basically uh, very much a standard academic document that's about uh, you know not plagiarizing and, uh, and and not cheating those being the really key elements of the response to chat gpt or any form of technology in teaching and learning so this is just a little snapshot of some of the content that's on the two pager that we put together uh, you should be able to find that 
if you do a bit of a Google search for it, or if you go to our melbourne-cshe.unimelb.edu.au site, you'll find a link there, which is the link to the previous page and the link to the to the actual document. Um, it has changed quite rapidly, about uh, four or five times of versions of it already, because as we all know, ChatGPT has been changing and gaining new um, abilities, new tools, uh, new uh, boundaries around what can actually do very, very rapidly as well. So ChatGPT being based on GPT uh, 3.5, uh, GPT-4 is now out, uh, although you have to pay for the upgrade, uh, but it has been available for a little while now as the engine behind Bing and the AI search of Bing. So some of the things that we just wanted to give as suggestions for people was focus on what the limitations of chat GPT are and tweak your assessments that way. So it's, it's not self-aware, at least not yet and uh, who knows where it ever will be, but uh, it, it doesn't do well with the effective domain. It doesn't possess critical thinking skills, so basically it scrapes content off the internet and pulls it all together and summarizes it. It certainly does very badly at uh, referencing and uh, assigning um, you know, authorship to what it's actually summarizing. And so really doubling down on things like academic citations and uh, good formatting of those citations is it's a bit of a no-brainer, really. What you do find, uh, if you haven't tried it yet yourself, is that when ChatGPT does create a summary or a, a document for you uh, based on your prompts and you ask it to do some referencing, generally those references will be either to completely different articles or they'll be completely made up. Uh, including the DOIs, they may look like they're actually uh, good and relevant, but when you check them, you'll find that uh, most of them are actually completely incorrect. We've got a little bit of a resource page here as a Padlet, and I thought if you're interested, you might want to check this out. So there's a QR code link to it. And if you want to have a look in the chat, there's also a link to it in the chat as well. So this is just a co-curated page, Padlet, by the Mobile Learning Special Interest Group from Escalite. And uh, about a dozen people contributed to this ideas around changing assessments for semester one, but also ideas, if you look under the other and resources, ideas for a bit of a future look as well. What can you possibly do with ChatGPT and other types of AI? Uh, you know, beyond ChatGPT, looking at Image and uh, DALI and Whisper for uh, text, audio, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's probably enough from me, so I'll hand back. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing you know, your insights regarding what your university is doing to support your academic teaching staff members as well, and obviously having the um, live curated Padlet board as well within the mobile SIG space. Thank you for that. Um, next person, I would like to introduce Ruth Dimes. Uh, Ruth Dimes is a pro professional teaching fellow and director of business masters with, within the business school in the University of Auckland. Auckland in New Zealand. So um, over to you, Ruth. Um, thank you, Leanne, and kia ora, everyone. Uh, another person joining from Auckland in New Zealand. It seems like a popular place today. So uh, as Leanne mentioned, I work in the business school at the University of Auckland, and the insights I'm going to share today are from our experiences that from earlier this year, where we were some of the very first um, in the university to be dealing with chat GPT. So rather than teaching in semesters, we teach in quarters. So on the 9th of January, we were going live with a lot of courses and assessments that were already designed. We ourselves were learning about chat GPT. Our students were obviously also learning about chat GPT. So I'm going to share a few of our experiences there, what we did on, on the fly to adjust assessments and how that's really informed some of our thinking going forward in terms of uh, assessment design. So um, we were very much uh, the guinea pigs, certainly for the business school and actually for 
a lot of the university um, teaching so early this year. So um, in the Southern Hemisphere where we are, the semesters normally start kind of end of February, early March, whereas we were teaching live on the 9th of January. So a lot of our courses were already published. Um, some of the assignments, the students already had them. So, uh, and as Thomas mentioned as well, it's um, because of the publication of course outlines, you can't simply go and change all of the assessments. So very early on, um, we were getting more informed about ChatGPT and I thought I'd just put on the screen here some of the questions that we started getting from students because we were thinking about it um, ourselves in terms of education and assessment, but obviously students are thinking of it and they're thinking of it in a, maybe a slightly different way to us. So number one question that came week one, can I use ChatGPT? Um, second question that emerged, and this is probably because we have a lot of international students in Auckland, can I use ChatGPT to improve my English? And actually, this is one of the uses that we've seen um, almost the most in the business school. So being used as a, as a, not just translation software, but a way of improving sort of English communication skills uh, in written English. Uh, third question, which is one that we struggled with uh, live and continue to struggle with really is acknowledging use of ChatGPT when, how would that stand up in terms of academic in integrity? And the last four and five, questions four and five I show, show students interest in how we're going to grade them. So will I be marked down if I do use it? Um, if lazy students, this is students words, use chat GPT to get better grades, how can I do um, better than them? So there's a lot of concern here and think about how, how to use it, how I'm being graded, is it going to affect grade distribution? Uh, and these were concerns uh, of ours as well. Um, are we going to see a, a kind of a, a huge increase in grade inflation, um, how are we going to try and get those top students to get those critical thinking skills um, and what we did on the fly. So these are the questions from the students and, and they were also questions informing what we were doing as well. Um, this was our initial response, so our sort of live response in January as we're finding out more about ChatGPT. Um, given the context we're in, in the business school. So the courses we teach are, for example, masters in marketing, masters in accounting, international business, human resource management. It became very clear very early that A, we can't block or ban this kind of technology and B, students are going to be using it immediately. And also it's highly disruptive to some, several of the industries that they're going into. So courses running in digital marketing, for example, it's disrupting huge areas there in terms of content creation and so on. So um, it became very clear that we were going to have to allow use of it, um, but just make students really clear about the risks and weaknesses of ChatGPT. And we, we asked lecturers to lead this process. So rather than um, expecting students to find out its risks and weaknesses, we asked lecturers to let the students know that they've run all assignments and tests through JetGPT and have just a frank conversation about um, AI and how it's disrupting higher education and how it's disrupting all of the industries that they want to uh, go into. Question four has been a real challenge actually and we started asking students to acknowledge use of um, chat GPT. I mean, similar to Thomas's comments earlier, um, so, you know, stating that it's your own work, stating that you're not plagiarizing and so on. But it, it is very, very difficult to police this because I think if chat GPT is used well and used how we would like students to use it, so maybe as a prompt, but then with some critical thinking and extra research, it's actually really quite difficult to detect. So I suppose we're trying to appeal to a moral high ground in terms of students acknowledging their use, but whether any of that would actually stand up in an academic misconduct case, um, not entirely sure. So that was our experience sort of early on uh, in, in the quarter. Where we're going to from here, uh, and again, this is maybe 
specifically to the business school, but probably not. Um, it's, it's just to focus on, well, what does a human do in the world of business? What, what are these human skills that AI can't bring and how can we use these tools? So we're very much looking at encouraging the appropriate, I should probably put, say, encourage the appropriate use of artificial intelligence tools and designing assessments for to assess that human side. So to give an example on one of the accounting courses that I'm working on now in um, later on this year, we're doing an assessment using prompt engineering. It's a course on corporate reporting and corporate social responsibility reporting, sustainability reporting. So we're asking students to use ChatGPT to generate a CEO statement on sustainability. We're then asking students to edit their prompts, so to continually refine their prompts. And at each stage, when they change their prompt or they ask ChatGPT to include more information, for example, reference to sustainability standards or SDGs, to do a critical reflection on that, to say, well, actually, the initial output doesn't include these references and details. The theory and the research paper that we've used say that these elements are an important part of um, sustainability reporting. So we're using that student input side to ask the, get them to cr critically reflect on you know, how, how do you use prompts effectively to get what, what you want and, and breaking it down step by step. Uh, also looking at the final end, so uh, editing skills. If you use ChatGPT to form a structure or something, um, what, hum what do you have to check? What, it, what may be incorrect? Um, and what are you going to have to go and find some extra research to support, for example? So I think there's a lot of excitement actually about the use of um, AI tools in, in certain types of uh, uh, assessment. Um, it's also talking about using things like avatars for um, to interact with students to make um, sort of authentic conversations and that kind of thing. Um, but there are also huge challenges here too that I'm sure everyone is facing. Firstly, just keeping up to speed with everything. And it's not just the AI developments, it's also their use in industry. So how quickly are industry responding and what are the skills that students are, are going to need uh, in their roles? And then, of course, the, the security of a, assessment, if it's some of our um, accounting exams, for example, are in, um, externally assessed by accounting bodies who require assessment security. Um, we're currently running digital tests and exams on campus, bring your own device. The whole nature of invigilation changes and the, the um, assessment tools we're using in Spira that we used in, in lockdown are not really that suited to an, an on-campus um, bring your own device um, environment. So that's the area that we're really struggling with now, not just security, but authenticity, um, making sure that students are producing their own work uh, in a secure environment that we know who we're, um, who we're giving degrees to uh, in the end. So uh, those are the challenges we're facing. I'm sure I'm very interested in other people's uh, experiences of those, but that's probably all me. So back to you, Yeah. Thank you, Ruth, for giving such a broad, um, you know, and also detailed account in terms of what your business school is doing and particularly in um, accounting as well. So it's really great to actually um, learn and share what, what you're doing as well, as well as the insights from the type of questions that students are giving. So. Thank you for sharing that. that. That's fabulous. What I would like to do is introduce the next speaker as well. So it's actually great that we've got a diverse range of um, speakers from different disciplines. So here we have Mitra Yayaya Seri from um, La Trobe University. Uh, Mitra is from the Mathematics and Statistics discipline. So over to you, Mitra. Thanks, Leanne. And, um... Hello everyone, my name is Mitra Jalzayeri and uh, I'm a lecturer of statistics at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. I have over 20 years of experience in teaching statistics to students with different academic backgrounds. 
And I have a number of internationally published articles on the effects of blended teaching methods and interventions to reduce students' statistics anxiety. In 2022, I was awarded the UK Higher Education Academy Fellowship and have been the recipient of our school's Commendation for Teaching Excellence Award. With the introduction of ChatGPT, by the end of last year, my research focus transitioned from statistics anxiety to how to include AI-assisted assessments in my uh, statistics subject and will AI-assisted generative tools be useful in teaching and learning statistics. As you all know, statistics is a fundamental tool in scientific research with major applications in many industries, including economics, psychology, biology, medicine, engineering, and public policy. Statistics provides methods for testing hypotheses and determining whether observed differences or relationships in data are statistically significant or likely due to chance. Statistics allows us to make inferences about populations based on sample data, and it allows us to make predictions about future events or trends based on historical data. Statistics provides us with the tools and methods to make informed decisions based on data analysis. It's a tool to evaluate the reliability and validity of research findings. Um, now, uh, first I talk about biostatistics subject, which I usually teach in the first semester. Just before the start of the semester, I realized that most of the questions in the assignments could be answered partially using ChatGPT. I decided to embrace this tool and use it positively to support students' learning. This subject, biostatistics, is a second year undergraduate subject with an enrollment of 12 students this year. All the students who have enrolled in this subject have already completed an introductory statistics subject. The assessment components for this subject comprised of four assignments where students submit their solutions via Ternitin and a final paper and pencil face-to-face -face exam. The subject runs for 12 weeks with weekly two-hour lecture workshops and two-hour practice computer lab. To use ChatGPT positively in this subject and to enhance the students' participation and engagement for week two and four, I divided the weekly lecture slides into smaller sections and assigned each student to give a presentation on a specific section. For assignment one, I included a question that required the students to identify which topic was the most challenging for them over the past three weeks and how they used ChatGPT to better understand the material. Additionally, they were asked to specify the questions for which they used ChatGPT. For assignment two to four, I added a section to the assignments where students were required to record their solution while explaining the concept and the steps they took for one question. By using the method, the, this method, we can capture both the learning objectives and the students' satisfaction. I should mention that for each assignment, I remind the students to declare whether they have used any help to answer the questions to provide us with a screenshot uh, uh, of the solutions that ChatGPT has provided for the sections of the assignment, along with their comments. This semester, we introduced ChatGPT to determine whether we could enhance learning in our biostatistics subject. The class is a small and taught entirely face-to-face. -face. However, 
In the upcoming semester, we plan to expand our research by measuring a student's deep learning while using ChatGPT in a much larger class of first year health sciences students conducting a statistics project. Our research will address several other issues as well. Now, for semester two, we are conducting a larger scale study. Our team consists of the five leading educators and researchers in our university. We have had weekly meetings to design a study to be implemented on the second semester this year to measure the effect of ChatGPT on first year health sciences students' statistics learning. The assessment will be completed through a template that will be developed in PebblePad and the students will be required to populate text fields in PebblePad uh, to answer the questions. A survey will be given to all the students regarding their attitude, confidence, anxiety towards the statistics learning a week prior to the start of this assessment and after completing the assessment. There will be 30 separate workshops to be delivered throughout each week with a maximum capacity of 60 students during week 9 and 12 to prepare students for this assessment task. Half of the workshops will be conducted following the traditional way, and the other half will be conducted by advising the students how to use ChatGPT to obtain assistance for this project. In the AI group, the facilitators and the students will formulate inputs into AI to generate authentic research scenarios and statistical outcomes. The outcomes of AI will form the basis of discussions about research outcomes. The teaching sessions will aim to teach students how to describe research outcomes such that they can be applied to evidence-based practice for health professionals. So the sample consists of all 1,800 first-year health sciences students from the main campus and four regional campuses who are conducting a statistics project as one of their assessment tasks. And uh, some of our uh, research questions are, what is the effect of using AI to learn a statistical concepts on the ability to interpret and describe research outcomes compared to a group of students who did not use AI? And then what impact will using AI have on a student's independent learning capabilities? And what is the relationship between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation and enjoyment of using AI among students? So that is uh, what we have reached up to now. And uh, we have got the weekly meetings and uh, we see how it goes for the bigger project. And thank you. Thanks, Mitra. Thank you for sharing, um, you know, a more detailed account in terms of what you're doing within your um, subject team as well, in terms of how you're using generative AI to adapt your assessments. And um, and, it's, and thank you so much for sharing your um, subtle research as well, because we need more of that more evidence-based research in this area as well going forward. So I'm sure we look forward thank to you, hearing yeah. some results and outcomes going forward. Thank you. My next speaker. We have Richard Hall. Richard Hall is a senior lecturer in computer science within La Trobe in Australia. So over to you, Richard. Hello, everybody. I'll assume that you can hear me until otherwise informed. Uh, I'm uh, currently teaching a class uh, to first year programming students. Uh, computer science students, teaching them how to do Python, the fundamentals of Python. Uh, I'm uh, taking the liberty of reframing the, the title of uh, this webinar. The, the, the title was Adapting Assessment in an AI Context. Uh, I'm actually thinking about it more from the point of view of 
how the students are assessing their own skills at, at programming and their own development uh, in Python programming in particular. And I wanted to focus more on how I'm using uh, ChatGPT in my own uh, class context, which I've uh, pretty much completely embraced. Okay, so so I've adapted this uh, continuum uh, from uh, Jane White and Kristen Lieber. Uh, that's from a from a paper that you can look up if you're interested. Uh, I thought this was an interesting place to start because uh, there's, there's ways that you can think about students, uh, labels that you can attach, and frameworks like this uh, are useful to, to think about where students are up to in their, in their progression. Uh, but there's also some, some dangers in you know, placing frameworks across the world. So for example, uh, you know, a, a beginning student, a really basic student who hasn't done any programming at all, uh, you would assume that they would start on the left. All I can do is copy code. Uh, in first year, they progress, you know, from, from left to right, ideally. Uh, they're, the, they're scaffolded along the way using their classes, all of the various tools and resources that they have, and they, they end up on the right uh, after they've, they've finished a, a few years studying computer science. That, that in, in some sense, you know, captures the, the temporal aspect, but there, there's, there's other ways that you can, you can look at this. For example, you might say, well, it's actually very efficient to copy code, uh, but when you're, when you're tinkering, you're actually involved in a slightly different exercise. When you're copying code, you're just given a question, you source the answer from wherever you can. It might be a book, it might be another student, it might be chat GPT. You're just efficiently getting the answer as quickly as possible. Uh, but when you're at the tinkering end, uh, you're exploring, you're, you're actually looking at what, what the effective questions are. So there, there's some biases in this framework in the sense that it assumes, for example, that professionals never copy code. Well, in fact, professionals copy code all the time. They're using very high level abstract libraries. They're, they're copying and they're adapting code all the time. Uh, so, to, so to simply take something like this and, and impose it upon the world and say, for example, that lazy students uh, are the only ones that copy code and the diligent ones are, are always the tinkerers. Uh, it isn't actually the case. But in some sense, there, there is some progression from left to right. There is some progression from dependency uh, to independency. Sure, on the left, it's more passive. On the right, it's more active. And in some sense, you know, we are trying to step students along this pathway. So I think, I think in, in, in some ways it is a reasonable way to think about uh, the progress of students. So in terms of the self assessment of students, uh, I do need to mention that there is actually uh, a very high rate of this is worldwide of, of, of students dropping out of first year programming. Uh, and a, a recent paper uh, uh, done by the authors above, who I've just inserted upon the text because I'm not really going to talk about the text in detail, looked at this list of, of items and investigated a couple of hundred students. And they, they wanted to investigate where students are assessing themselves, when they, where do they think they're bad at programming? What actually makes them, them think, oh, look, this is just too hard. It, it's too painful. And you know, I'm, I'm just gonna give up. You know, students who, who get stuck on errors for 20 minutes or an hour, uh, you know, they can 
it can be an extremely frustrating experience uh, learning the program. And there can be extremely tiny errors. So I've really embraced ChatGPT as, as a way to help students to overcome some of these things. So the sorts of things that I've, I've overcome uh, is getting simple errors. So you can pop a line of code into ChatGPT and you can say above that, what's wrong with this? So every uh, workshop that I have with my, my class of 40 odd students, I'm typing something in. Sometimes there'll be a simple error in it. I, I need to normalize that you always get mistakes when you're programming, uh, simple mistakes. I ask students to solve something, they copy it into the, the chat window on, on Zoom. I then pop that into the chat GPT. They say, this bit isn't working. I, I want them to be really comfortable that it's a way to help them get past those really basic errors. So uh, I use Google Colab as well, and it gives uh, compiler errors. So the, the three main uses that I have for ChatGPT is I get a little chunk of code and I say, what's wrong with this? It'll point something out. I, I copy an error from uh, the, the compiler and I say, what does this error mean? And I copy it in there. Or I copy the code in and the error there. Why am I getting this error? You know, for students who are coming at programming for the first time, it's a whole different language. It's a whole different way of thinking. I just think that it provides a level of scaffolding for first year students that is well beyond uh, anything that a co-pilot can, can, can provide. And I, I copy code into, into the chat window. I ask them to solve it. I ask them to solve little bits. I ask them to use ChatGP to help them solve little things. I don't want them spending a long time looking for, for simple errors. Uh, what I want to show them is that it's very normal to make mistakes. It's normal to fail fast, and it's normal to to try and get help with what you're doing. Uh, I don't I don't want them to do it alone. I want them to be growing that confidence, and I want them to see that uh, they can actually be uh, working on things and building those skills. So in the classroom context, what it actually looks like in practice when I'm running a Zoom session. I've got ChatGPT on the left, and I've got the piece of code that I'm working on on the right. Uh, I explore things, what does this do? Which is what I've got on the, the left in a little line of code. And it gives me a reasonable answer. I, I, I push students to, to ask different things. I get them to answer things. Uh, but I've, I've really strongly integrated it into my class, and uh, the students so far seem to be responding and seem to be progressing against the coding exercises that we're doing. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Richard. Look, uh, I think you know your 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 response, your part, you know, providing intricacies in terms of what you're doing in the classroom as well. And it's good to think about you know what we can do to scaffold and you know look at developing learning as part of the process and also that formative part to assessment. So thank you for sharing that for the discipline of first year, um, first year programming students. Um, so thank you for that. We've got all our four panel speakers um, give their um, speech about um, AI and what they're doing for assessment and um, developing learning. I'm going to pass it over to Penny, Penny Wheeler. Thanks, Leanne, and thanks very much to all of our panel for showing us that great variety. Uh, I. Matthew, perhaps if anybody has a question right now, there's been a great discussion happening in the chat. If anybody had a particular question for a panelist, this would be a great time while I'm just yep. uh, getting that Miro <clears throat> board up for us. Folks, um, yeah, if you want to ask a question, you can either type it into the text chat or we invite you to put up your virtual hands. So that's the raise hand button in the bottom center of the screen. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question by a microphone, um, you may choose to address it to a particular panel member or just the general panel. There has been some quite active discussion in the chat. That's great too. This sure has. I think it'll be good to read that afterwards. Mm. So all of this will be, all the recording is going to be on the Transforming Assessment website. If you're on our mailing list, you'll know 
you'll get a message at some point in the future telling you it's available, but go to transformingassessment.com, look under the past sessions, you'll be able to find it. Uh, we include the text chat list, I'll clean it up a bit as well. Uh, so all the links that have been shared will be available to you after the session as well. Thank you. So on the screen at the moment, uh, we've got an image from an upcoming book by Werner Rossi in the UK. And I want to present it here now and also use it in the Miro board activity to widen out our discussion from the tweaks that some of our panelists described to that redesign that we know is coming from AI's advent. And I also thought it was a great chance. I mean, we thank Matthew very much for making the transforming assessment uh, webinar available and sharing that with the learning design SIG and the Teleadvisors SIG. I think AI also widens out our interests. So even assessment becomes, as I think Thomas mentioned earlier in the chat, looking at the process. So this um, overview of the whole learning and assessment cycle in Rossi's image here, I think is relevant in our response to AI. Um, I'll, I'll add the uh, link that you can see there on the board. I don't expect that everyone will be able to, to edit Miro, but you might like to add in the chat any, um, any strategies that you would like to see listed there. Our goal, just in this five minute um, activity, is to try and um, lay, start to lay out all of the various strategies that we've seen in the panel, that we've seen in our experience over the last couple of months, and try and make sense of that um, against a framework. There are multiple frameworks, of course, um, to look at assessment, to look at learning's relationship to assessment. This was just one of them. There's the link there if you are interested in actually um, working on the board or looking at the board later. And I'll share that screen too now, if I'm able to. <clears throat> uh, yep, you'll have to go into the bottom right hand corner, share content. Okay, right hand corner, share content. Okay, found it. So I've just rendered Rossi's diagram in a very simplistic way context, content, and assessment being those major arms there. If you get a chance, and I know that um, David's in the room at the moment, you might, I, I, when, when we were designing this webinar, I wasn't sure if our focus would be on text production, the generative uh, issues that, that were certainly very much part of the ac academic integrity discussion. So when you have a chance, you may like to just um, work your way down to this hidden corner here where I tried to represent David Rowland's idea about what is the continuum between, in a produced text, between the student working completely unaided, traditional, last year's student perhaps, or perhaps a, a student a decade ago might be more accurate, down to 100% worth of AI. So we didn't, in the end, have panelists who were focusing on that. We've had that great variety of um, industry tools, stats and coding. But I just thought, I, I'm, I'm very interested in this continuum. I just wanted to share that with you as well while I had the chance. But taking us back to this, um, this catalog of the kinds of designs that are aware of AI, work with AI, avoid AI, um, this great, thanks so much for starting to add to this. Here are the, the two of the examples from uh, the, what the panelists just presented. I took um, the personal tutor idea. Also, we heard about that from Richard as well, personal tutor, personal advisor in, in sorting out code issues. And from Ruth's discussion, I picked up the, um, industry use, so assessments that 
show that the student can use prompting. And if we consider uh, Rossi's diagram, she of course is looking for um, an, an AI, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm saying an authentic um, assessment of course being part of inclusive learning design. So the, the tree itself is not designed for AI um, assessment, AI learning, but it is helpful in trying to put in the inclusive lens first and think about the AI aware assessment designs in terms of the people that they're serving, the students that they're serving. So thank you so much for, for adding those, um, those strategies there. Again, thinking about make a, how can AI develop a learning environment, that context issue, thinking about how it can help with practice as we've seen. Um, I think I saw on the University of Melbourne page, the idea that essay was a personal narrative. So again, not considering the product, considering the process. Uh, so I might add that in um, here. Uh, but yes, I just wanted to, to present this for your discussion. There's some great people in the room here who would have tried some of these strategies, but trying to map them out as far as how they're contributing to support the students and how they're uh, appearing right across that, that teaching cycle. So if anybody had any anything they'd like to add, please do so if they like to put it in the chat. Um, we could we could add it in from there, and um, Matthew, I'll I might return it to you soon. Um, I think people have been uh, swapping between the two environments. We see yes. lots, lots of if you go to the the mirror board, there's lots and lots of little things flying around. Um, <laughs> and I think people are able to add onto it, aren't they? So yes. Keep Keep, keep adding as yeah. we go and I'll, so I'll, I'll added, tidy it up a bit. I added AI literacy is sort of an overview arching or overview set of skills to sort of help. Right. I guess both students and, you know, uh, academic support staff, etc. So the both on the university side as well as on the student side of, you know, people need to learn about these new tools, understand what they're capable of, what they can and can't do. Um, and because there's so many different of them, you know, it becomes also for courses, which tool is good for which purposes, which outcomes. So I guess it's like TPAC, but for adding, adding that AI literacy to the mix as well as a teacher and, you know, as a, as a learner or a professional, you'll need to be able to use these tools in your future work as a you know, your student going forward. Um, so having that sort of AI literacy as, how would you call it? Uh, um, a layer that goes across the top of all of this, um, I think is some, something that we need to be involved in. We need to be fostering this. As an and I also, yeah. Yeah. I also think, Matthew, this is def, I mean, the, the, the phenomenon of AI, again, demands the, that collaborative approach. So the, t the designer, the technologist and the teacher working together and thinking about how AI, how that technology appears throughout the unit. Um, and I was very excited to see in Mitch's design that the teleadvisor is right up there as part of the team. So, um, I, I, yes, I don't want to go raving on about how everything's changed, but I really do think that it sharpens that need to, um, can, to take a step back and consider how the student learning is going to happen, where, how assessment flows out of learning, how the human skills that Ruth mentioned 
I think designers are very aware of setting up the technology, but always with the human in mind. What are they going to do with it? What do they need? So thank you very much for those contributions. I look forward to seeing to seeing more. Mm. Um, I've just been sort of scrolling up. There were some questions in there. One was, I'm, just, I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't quite find it. I just remember seeing it. Um, you know, what, what, do, what does our academic community need to support them to, to make this shift, to make this change? So anybody on the panel is welcome to talk. Penny has certainly spoke about the collaborative effort that's required. But it's probably just more than, you know, those three people getting together, isn't it? Um, any other comments? I've got some ideas, but I'd like to hear from other people. Yeah, I agree with the uh, being a collaborative approach is, is, uh, is a really way, good way to go. Forming teams of people. So it's not just academics trying to work it out themselves uh, and uh, people who are really good at their context discipline, but maybe not necessarily learning theory or educational design as such. So having a collaborative team is certainly a powerful. Mm. Um, do you see there's a sort of role for thinking about this, particularly in perhaps longer term, about program redesign? So thinking about, I, I guess it's been coming at us for a long time that, you know, the structures of such things as, you know, individual units being chopped up in programs vis-a-vis -a, -vis a view or program-wide assessment that requires a bit of a rethink about how degree, degree structures are created and administered and run. Um, I sort of see this uh, sort of Kath Ellis's video on um, talking about generative AI uh, through the Campus Morning Mail series where she was talking about this idea of retooling. Um, you know, we have to retool our education system, as it were, to, to better deal with the new paradigm. Sort of in, in that in that ill. Yeah, Connie's saying yes, this new disruption may put an emphasis on programmatic assessment. I, in my mind, it's sort of it, it's trying to bring to the surface how we go about assurance of learning for students and looking at process rather than product. Um, and I think that's also what Kath Ellis was saying in the video as well. Um, for those people who get Campus Morning Mail, you, you'll be able to look up. That was really good um, um, interview with um, Stephen Marston. Any other comments from the panel about that? Um, Matthew, yeah, I, I would really agree. I think even before ChatGPT, we were looking at the importance of assessing the learning process rather than just this really kind of big large assessment output at the end process um, and I think this has just enhanced that and I think it, one thing I wanted to mention a, a real positive I think is that I think academics and learning design communities certainly in, in the University of Auckland have come closer together through the challenges we're all facing at the same time with AI so it would be really nice to see that continue because it is a collaborative effort and I think we're both um, yeah, our experiences, we're having sort of more honest conversations, I guess, because we're all in an unknown area uh, and it'd be mm. good to see that continuing. Yeah, I think the pandemic kind of gave us a bit of a kick in the pants um, globally of that. And this is kind of like the second round to it, really. You know, oh, we're coming back for some more. <laughs> you thought the pandemic was over. You ain't seen nothing yet, folks, sort of thing. Um, Rebecca, you've got your virtual hand up. Would you like to say something? You're welcome to use the microphone. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Um, I understand that you are all mostly academics in higher education, but there are other levels of education. And I would really appreciate your minds to think about secondary and even maybe primary education, because, uh, of course, when students use ChatGPT to generate something, when they're in university, at least there's a chance that the register they use, the, the language they use, the ideas they have are sort of age appropriate. But if a secondary student, secondary school or primary school student uh, uses ChatGPT and comes in with this amazing thing for their age group, 
uh, it's even worse. So uh, could you could you could you make your horizon a little bit wider, please? Thank you. Sure. I mean, I I agree that you know, we should. The caveat being that Ascolite and our special interest groups and this webinar series are very much focused on higher education, um, but certainly the school sector, the primary sector. Um, and indeed the, vet, the vocational education sector, because a lot of the time we are university focused here. Um, of course, the kind of, you know, the problems that the school system, the primary, the, the vet sector face are, are going to be different. Um, this is the hint, I'm hoping to arrange something for the vet sector coming up soon. Um, we might have some um, trying to arrange from about mid-year. But yeah, the, the problem is that wherever we look, uh, most of the academic research is about uh, higher education. And for one of our programs, that's not such a big problem because it's the, the sort of sixth form level, so it's pre-university. But we do have, you know, we have educational program, pro programs for three-year-olds to 19-year-olds. And um, it's very, very difficult. I understand that the SIG is about higher education and that I'm in the wrong place, but it's not only the wrong place, it's nearly the only place so um i don't know maybe we should start something ourselves um yes that's possible a and little bit if you want to i'm happy to collaborate <laughs> no, no, okay um, maybe we should talk about yeah. that then um okay i know matt bauer at macquarie professor matt bauer at macquarie he's he's located in, in a faculty of education and of course their their research is focused on the school sector um okay. so perhaps looking for you know, academics who are doing research into the school sector and how AI impacts that might be a place to look. Um, I will yeah. but try to find definitely them. Definitely not but my area of expertise. So, yeah. If yeah. anybody has names, could they put them in the chat? Because it's really difficult to find people who don't look at their own students, but look at other people's students. Yeah, so Professor Matt Bauer at Macquarie University would be a place. I know he did a video on looking at, um, you know, AI in education. Um, he, 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 do, he does cross reference to higher ed, but, you know, as I said, faculties of education would be the way to go um, to seek anything like that. Uh, just quickly, Matthew um, and Rebecca, I think there's a academic at Deakin, Lucinda McKnight, who's doing some kind of research within high school. In generative AI, um, so you might want to reach out to listen to McKnight at Deakin as well. There's a research project happening there. Thanks. Okay, folks, thank you very much for joining. We have one minute to go, so if there's any last minutes, uh, welcome to paste any links. We have a lot of people in the space from a lot of different institutions. If your institution is doing something interesting in AI, has a blog series, has resources, please stick them into the text chat so we can capture those um, if you happen to have them at your fingertips. But thank you very much for joining. Um, the last little piece was to talk about the next session, which is coming up. Um, my memory is really bad. I think it's 3rd of May. Um, we have not yet got the session arranged, but um, if you're on the mailing list for transforming assessment, you will find out about what it is. It will be a joint session with the Assessment and Higher Education Network in the UK. I've uh, always got some interesting speakers from that group. So thank you very much for joining us, folks. We're on the hour. Um, the recording will be published afterwards. And thank you very much for joining. Thank you to our panel, Leanne, Mitra, Penny, Richard, Ruth, and Thomas. It's fantastic to have you along. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us again for future sessions. Thanks very much. Thanks folks. very much, Matthew. Thank you.